we are going to start a new unit and a um, new equation now. We're going to go on uh, to hyperbolic equations. We've looked at elliptic and parabolic equations. We now move on to hyperbolic equations. Um, the canonical example here is um, elastodynamics in whatever dimensions you wish. We're going to look at it in three dimensions because we've left 1D far behind now. Okay, so um, title of this uh, topic of this unit is um, methods for hyperbolic uh, linear, of course, PDEs in vector unknowns all right and uh, the example is uh, linear uh, linear uh, elastodynamics in 3D. Okay, so the setting is the following. I don't have my Lego vectors today for my bases, but I'll use my fingers. Okay, so that's our basis, and this is the body of interest. Uh, when we considered uh, linearized uh, steady state elasticity, we were interested, of course, in how this uh, ball would deform or how this continuum potato would deform. Uh, we didn't, however, consider the uh, so-called dynamic effects or, the, or the, the effects that lead to wave propagation, right? Uh, we couldn't, for instance, for that reason, also study the problem of uh, uh, this ball being actually tossed through space, right, and tumbling through space and deforming perhaps at the same time, right? We couldn't look at the time evolution of that problem, right, because we were looking at the steady state problem. Now we take away that restriction and look at the full-blown elastodynamics problem, okay? So here we have, the, the setting is essentially the same uh, as far as our uh, pictures are concerned here, right? So we have uh, our figures are concerned here, E1, E2, E3. We have a body of interest, right? This is omega. As we've done before, we have a um, decomposition of the domain into Dirichlet into a Dirichlet subset for that particular component of the displacement field, right, and the corresponding Neumann subset. Okay, and this holds for i equals one to three, right? Uh, X would be a point here, right? Uh, which would be described by its position vector, right? Everything that we've seen uh, from before holds, right? The decomposition of the of the boundary um, into the Dirichlet. Um, sorry, I got the union in the wrong position. It's the union of this Dirichlet boundary and the Neumann boundary. And uh, of course, those are disjoint. We know that this is the empty set and so on, all right? We have all of this. Uh, this, of course, holds for I equals one, two, Right, three dimensions. Okay, I'm going to straight away put down the strong form of the problem. Right, uh, the strong form of the problem is the following. Now, given uh, data, u g i t bar i f i. Right. In addition, we need some more data now. 
we need also uh, other functions which I am going to denote as u i naught, okay, and um, v i naught, okay. We are going to use them for initial conditions, right. Uh, so, given all of this, and of course the constitutive relation sigma i j equals c i j k l epsilon k l. We also know that we have the kinematics, right? K epsilon k l equals one half um, partial of u k with respect to x l plus partial of u l with respect to x k, right? We have all of this stuff, right? The only new things that you are seeing here are these two functions which I am telling you right now we are going to use for initial conditions. There, there, there is one more. We do need another coefficient uh, which I am going to denote again here as rho. Rho here is just the mass sorry, the mass density, okay. Let me get rid of these arrows from here so that it is not confusing to think that they are pointing up from density. No. Those are the initial conditions. All right, we have all of this. Um, the problem that we are trying to find is the fall is to find u i, okay. Now, it is a function of position and time, okay, right. And remember that i runs over 1, 2, 3, right. So, uh, everything that I have written on the first line, the first five uh, functions is uh, down here, right. These functions are all just components of vectors, right. Okay. So, we want to find u i uh, such that such that the following holds. Um, rho second derivative of u i with respect to time equals uh, sigma um, i j comma j plus f i, okay, in omega cross 0 comma t. Just as we did for the uh, time dependent uh, parabolic problem, right, we uh, say that our PDE must hold over the spatial domain and uh, the time interval 0 to t, okay. Um, let me leave this here and then go on to the next slide to write out boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are no different, right. Uh, for boundary conditions, uh, we have um, u i at um, some position x um, and time t equals this given function u g for component i at positions x and t and time t, right. Now, note that we are allowing here that uh, Dirichlet data to vary with time, okay. This just allows us to have time dependent Dirichlet boundary conditions just as we had for our uh, time dependent uh, heat conduction or time dependent mass diffusion, right. We allowed the possibility that the Dirichlet conditions varied with time, okay. Um, right. Um, at any point x belonging to uh, a point on the Dirichlet boundary, right, for that particular displacement component. Our Neumann boundary condition or our traction boundary condition also is as before, okay, function of position and time um, for a point x belonging to corresponding Neumann boundary. 
And note here that I'm continuing to use t bar for retraction uh, function, whereas the t here is for time. Okay, so it, was, it was an anticipation of this uh, final clash of uh, notations that I've been using t bar for the traction. Okay, initial conditions. Our um, elastodynamics equation, uh, our PDE for elastodynamics is a second order PDE in time, and therefore, how many initial conditions do we need? Two, right? So we have ui at some position x, but at time t equals zero, equals u, how did I write it? ui naught, okay? Which could be a function of position. We're allowing, we, we, we of course need to allow the possibility that, uh, we, not just the possibility, we have to allow for initial conditions so to be uh, defined at every point, right? So for every point x, we have an initial condition of the displacement, right? Which basically says what is the initial configuration of the body, okay? So this holds uh, uh, for all x in it is second order, so we need two initial conditions. The next initial condition is for u i dot x comma zero equals the specified distribution of velocities. Okay, what this means is that at the initial condition, we are saying that not only do we start out knowing where every point on this uh, body is, right? That is the first of those initial conditions, but we are saying we must also know what the initial velocities are. Okay, that's the second initial condition. All right, this is it. This is our strong form. Okay. I'm going to straight away go ahead and write out the weak form. Right? Uh, the weak form, of course, this is going to be the infinite dimensional weak form, but we know that uh, going from there to the finite dimensional weak form is not such a big thing, uh, the weak form, okay? Given all the data that I've just put out there, right? I'm not going to repeat the data, okay? Uh, the weak form is find ui belonging to S, Okay, where for our purposes here, S consists of all UI such that UI equals UGI on okay. Um, find this such that. For all W i belonging to V, where V consists of all weighting functions. Remember, W i is our weighting, our, our weighting functions. V belongs to W i such that W i equals zero on that Dirichlet boundary. Okay. Such that for all w i belonging to v, the following con in integral condition holds. Now, integral over omega w i rho second derivative, second time derivative of u i plus integral over omega w i comma j sigma i j dv plus, um, sorry, is equal to integral over omega w i f i dv uh, plus, as before, the sum over spatial dimensions 1 to 3 now, 
um, integral over the corresponding Neumann boundary W i T bar i D s. Okay, that's it. Now, if you stare hard at this uh, weak form, you should observe that it is obtained by just adding one term to our weak form for the steady state elasticity problem. Right? And that extra term is just this one. Observe furthermore that this term requires no integration by parts. Right? It's literally obtained by looking at the left hand side of our strong form, which is right here. Okay, look at the left hand side of the equation at the bottom. Multiply that by wi, the weighting function. Integrate over the domain. Right? We know that the rest of the stuff on the right hand side uh, is what attracts integration by parts, right? especially the divergence of sigma, the first term on the right hand side in the strong form. Well, I know directly how the weak form arises. Nothing new here. Right? Just add in the, this uh, extra term on the left hand side. All right, we'll end the segment here. When we return, we will simply write out the weak form, the, sorry, the finite dimensional weak form and go directly into the finite element uh, matrix vector equations. Good.